are the best, but every single one of them wants to stand out and be extraordinary. So two things in case he doesn't say it. Write this in your notes. You ready? You need to buy tonight the book called Purple Cow. Now he's written 20 books, but the one Purple Cow, which is all about standing out, to me, like so many of his books at the time of the life that I read them are always the perfect one. But when I go back and I reference Seth, I always go to Purple Cow first. You with me? Because it makes people go, oh, if we all look the same, we are the same. So I've got to do something that makes me stand out like a purple cow as an example. But the second thing I tell everybody to do is I... This is one of my dearest friends and personal clients, Josh. I could see you walking from anywhere. I love you, buddy. I have that same jacket, by the way. The other thing I want you to do is tonight, I want you to go to sethgodin.com and I want you to sign up for his free newsletter. I don't read it. I study it. I study it. Every single day, my friends, for 9,500 days, he wrote something and shared it with the universe. And I imagine it started out small, and today I'm sure it's in the millions and millions and millions of people that are absorbing his content and information so they can make better decisions to figure out how to take this beautiful little town, Jacksonville, yeah, and huh? become the most celebrated team and company and brokerage in your marketplace so you get to decide who you get to work with and who you don't. And he is, by the way, the one that said to me, hey, Tom, you work with professionals. That's why I like you. The industry is full of hacks. He said, let's help the professionals get even better. So are you guys ready for this? Okay, do me a favor, hold on. Even though he's gonna be on Zoom, I'm expecting the biggest standing ovation, screaming, hootering, and hollering, because he deserves all of that more for all of the work and what he's gonna do with you. Then we'll do 15 minutes of Q&A at the end. So get your questions ready. I believe they're ready back there. I'm looking at my team. So I'll just say, ladies and gentlemen, one of my mentors, Seth Godin. that in person in a very long time. Thank you. Okay, I want to talk about being together today, and I wish I was there together with you. I've written a whole bunch of books, and I realize that none of them are about things one can do by yourself. That the essence of what you do is you bring people together. You bring them together with their family. You bring them together with real estate. You bring the, the firm you work with together. And sometimes we call this work that we do marketing, but I think there's a lot of misunderstandings about it. So let's start with this. We are in the business of marketing. That modern marketing is different than marketing used to be. And if you can understand this, if you can learn this, you have this significant advantage over everyone who thinks they know what they're doing. Marketing is no longer advertising marketing isn't hype. Now this is worth decoding because for 50 years advertising and marketing were the same thing. It didn't matter if you were busy buying classified ads or if you were a big company buying TV ads. If you bought the right ads in the right volume, you made enough money to buy more ads. And this went on until the 1990s and I was the person who invented email marketing and then the web showed up and it started to change things. Because <clears throat> all of a sudden it was really hard to reach everyone. It's really hard now even to reach everyone in Jackson Hole or everyone in Cleveland because there are so many different places for people to be. And so people who thought they had the right to our attention started to spam us and hustle us and interrupt us and hand things out and basically just be a jerk to get more attention. And so marketing got a bad name. Marketing got the name of, oh, this is what we do to hustle something. This is what we do to promote something. And uh, Tom, sorry to say, this is what we do to get the word out, to stand out. That's not what I'm here to talk about. What I'm here to talk about is that we have to be very clear if we're a marketer about what we make. So if I ask that question, 
to someone in real estate, what do you make? Maybe they think I'm asking how much money do you make? That's not what I'm asking. What do you make? Well, you don't have a factory, you don't make widgets, and you might have keychains with your names on them, but you don't make the keychains. What do you make? And I think what you make is a difference. And I think what you make is change. Successful marketers make a change happen. Now that change could be something super trivial. That I was on a hike years ago in Peru, way up, 10,000 feet above sea level, and we turn around this curve on the uh, mountain, and there's somebody selling water. What does that person make? What change do they make? They turn, turn thirsty people into unthirsty people. Or maybe you work for a company that simply turns non-customers into customers. But I don't think that rises to the level of what you do. You make a significant change happen for the people who buy and who sell a home. And that change is not that you are a clerk because there are other people less trained, less hardworking, less skilled than you who can do that. Clerk work is not what we are here to talk about. What we want to talk about is who do you want your customers to become? As Michael Schrag has taught us, that is the essence of the real kind of change. What journey are they on? What does it mean to be a parent and be able to move to a different home? What does it mean to be a senior citizen and to sell your home and to extract your nest egg? What does it mean for your home to look one way or another way? What does it mean to be part of a community? We are here to help people become who they seek to become. And if you are building a team, the same thing is true for the junior folks that are coming along. They're not working for you because you're paying them the most. They're working for you because you see them and are helping them go on a journey to make change happen. And so if it touches the market, everything you do that touches the market is marketing. Not just the logo or where you put the sign or what time you have an open house, but the way you answer the phone and the way you comport yourself at the closing and the way you talk about people in front of their face and the way you talk about them behind their back and what happens in your office during hours when it's not being used by you to do your work. These are all marketing choices. And I've been lucky enough to know some very extraordinarily successful real estate professionals throughout my career. And one thing that I have noticed is that they are not successful because they are lucky. And they are not successful because they hustle harder. That they might be lucky and they might sometimes work harder than other people. But they are successful because they stand for something and because they help make a change happen. And it begins with practical empathy. The people you are serving, whether it's your buyers or your sellers or your staff, they don't know what you know. They don't want what you want. They don't believe what you believe. And we have to be okay with that. We have to be okay with that. You don't have to be a cancer survivor to be a successful oncologist. But what you do have to do is have empathy, practical empathy, to be able to see other people for who they are and where they seek to go. So I'm gonna come back to this over and over again today, but this is super important. In the next five years, the real estate industry is going to change more than it has changed any time in the last 50 years. It is going to be turned upside down, and it begins with this. Zillow knows more than you do, and that's good, not bad. It's good. It used to be that you could hoard information, that you knew more about something that was in some magic notebook than any person, buyer or seller, could discover. But that day, those days are over. And what it means is that people who are used to being clerks, who are used to being at the lowest level of the real estate business, are going to be replaced by a system the same way Uber replaced taxi companies everywhere you look. Because the taxi companies used to depend on drivers who knew something. You don't need to know anything to be an Uber driver except how to follow the steps. And the same thing is going to be true for anyone who's doing clerk work. Instead, the future is going to belong to people who choose to be on the hook. Now, I know that we were talking about Jackson Hole earlier. Years ago, 
I went to uh, an event in Jackson Hole with the Fast Company people. And they got us up one morning at 4.30 in the morning and they took us out for a fly fishing lesson. And I surprised people because I asked the guy if they, if they had any flies that didn't have a hook on them. Because I wanted to learn how to fly fish, but I didn't want to actually catch a fish. Because if I caught a fish, I would torture a fish and then I'd have to let the fish go. I decided my life would be better if I could just be present and learn to cast. But that got me thinking about on the hook, because fish don't like to be on the hook. Being on the hook is a bad place for a fish. But you, you need to be on the hook. Being on the hook means you made a promise to someone. You made a promise that you are now on the hook to keep. And that promise isn't a specific one, like I guarantee this much money will trade hands. It is a promise about humanity, about seeing people, about how we show up in the world. Because that is why someone is going to seek us out in the first place. So yeah, the world is upside down. There's a long overdue focus on racial injustice. There's a lot of insecurity about our health. There's so many things that are changing and happening in our world. And this is as normal as it is ever going to be again. And I could give you a list of 50 things that are gonna fundamentally change that your parents and your grandparents wouldn't even recognize. And it's all poised to happen. To the very fact that I'm talking to you today the way I am would have been impossible five years ago. There are revolutions all around us. And what revolutions do is they destroy the perfect and then they enable the impossible. You know what's impossible? It's impossible that I looked at more than 500 homes in one region of the Adirondacks in New York in less than three weeks. That's impossible. How could anyone look at 500 homes with tours of the inside and, and, and tax maps and everything? Of course we can do that now. But five years ago, it was impossible. That's what revolutions do. They destroy things that were perfect. Your industry was perfect. More than a million people making a somewhat decent or amazingly decent living, walking into an industry with very few barriers to entry. And yet, a lot of that perfection is going away because the clerks aren't going to be able to charge what they've been charging. And they're not going to be respected the way they've been respected because a computer knows more than they do. And if you don't believe me, ask a travel agent. Oh, that's right, you don't know any travel agents because they've all left the building. And none of you mourned it when they went away. You booked your ticket to come here today, wherever it here is, online because the internet knows more about where all the planes are than any human. And the same thing is gonna be true for someone who's merely a clerk. Okay, so Tom was talking about uh, my project, The Purple Cat. So I wanna give you the background out of it and tell you the story. Years ago, I did a book um, and it was an epic failure. It, I got a pretty decent advance and it didn't sell, partly because it came after, out right after 9-11 and partly because it was too complicated for a lot of people. So I got kicked out of the book industry. No one wanted my next book. Well, a few months later, a dear friend of mine who lived in Paris, France, Lionel Poulin, died in a tragic helicopter crash. And he and his wife left behind two young daughters uh, who I still care very much about. And I decided I wanted to dedicate a book to Lionel, but I couldn't do that because I didn't have a book and I didn't have a publisher. So I decided to write a book, write a book inspired by his bakery. Now the Poulain Bakery, you can still go, it's at 8 Rue de Cherche-Midi in Paris, regularly has a line out the door. Back in the old days, there'd be a line for an hour. People had flown in from Japan who were buying $400 worth of bread and flying home. And amazingly, two out of three of the two and three star restaurants in Paris served his bread at every meal. And amazingly, he didn't even make French bread or baguettes. What Lionel did, using flour, water, salt, and starter, four ingredients, which are two more ingredients than you use, he made a loaf of bread that was worth talking about. And so people came and they talked about it. We're gonna decode some of those things. There were no gimmicks, there was no hustle, there was no advertising, but there was a line out the door. So I made this book, but then I said, well, how am I gonna bring it to the world? And I decided to publish it myself. And publishing, printing is sort of expensive. Publishing is really hard. So I only made 5,000 copies of the book. I had a column in Fast Company Magazine that earned me permission 
anticipated, personal, and relevant messages delivered to the people who wanted to get them earned me permission to talk to about 100,000 readers. Because week after week, month after month, my column was in the magazine. So I wrote a column about the book, and at the end I said, if you send me $5 for postage and handling, I'll send you a free copy. Well, it just turned out it cost me $5 in postage and handling to make the whole thing. So I broke even, and I sent out the 5,000 copies. But I didn't send them out in an envelope. I sent them out in a milk carton. And if you think it's easy to put a book in a milk carton, I have to tell you that it's not. But leaving that aside, when people got the milk carton in the mail without an envelope, they didn't say, oh, a gimmick. Isn't that clever? What they saw was a flag, a flag that they could fly on their desk. And it was a flag about doing work you cared about. It was a flag about doing work that was remarkable. Not a hustle, not a gimmick, but work that was worth talking about. Because what it means to be remarkable is it is worth making a remark about. And what I argue in the book is that if it's worth making a remark about, people are going to talk about it. No one talked about this because I asked them to. No one talked about this because they liked me. They talked about it because they liked themselves. That it was an idea that would raise their status and affiliation, their standing in the world, if other people got the idea. And so the question that we begin with is, why on earth would anyone talk about you when you do a good job? Because back before you were in those days, did you talk about it? the person who bought or sold their house or helped you do so? Probably not. Because that would help them. It's like the person in the life insurance business asking for referrals. No one wants to do that. They want to talk about themselves. They don't want email, they want me mail. And so the argument begins with intentional design. I want you to be able to tell me, who exactly are you for? This change you seek to make, who is it for? What specific mindset? Who's it for and what's it for? After the change happens, can we tell? And that means you choose the smallest viable audience, not the biggest possible one, but the smallest one that can sustain you. 20 years ago, I knew a real estate broker in my town who specialized within the boundaries of the law into selling to people like her. She was a married woman who was gay, and she decided that gay married women were going to have a hard time being treated fairly by others. So she showed up at the right events. She reached out in an appropriate way. And that was her audience. Those were the people who were attracted to what she had to say because she made a bet that they wanted a similar change, that they wanted to be treated a certain way. Maybe your smallest viable audience are people who want to be in a certain building in Manhattan. And we all know that there are real estate brokers in that building who are making seven figures a year selling real estate in just one building because the geography implies a mindset. It implies a problem that someone has before they come to see you. You're not selling them a house. They can buy a house without you. You're selling them a story. And that story is one we tell ourselves and it's one we might tell other people. The smallest viable audience isn't a compromise. It's a stepping stone. My books have sold millions and millions of copies, but to a rounding error, zero. Zero percent of the people on earth have bought one of my books. And zero percent of the people in the United States have bought a house from me, zero. It's enough. We're not trying for everyone. Your motto can't be, if you need someone, I'm someone, because there's another someone one click away. And even though there's a lot of similar pricing in this industry, the idea that you're just gonna play by the numbers, that you're gonna make somebody more money if they sell with you or save somebody money if they buy from you, well, that's a race to the bottom. And the problem with the race to the bottom is you might win or come in second. That our opportunity, the reason that you're talking to someone like Tom is not because you need a spreadsheet to show that you're worth seeking out but precisely because you can't use a spreadsheet. People don't talk about the numbers. If someone even bothers to talk about how much money they made in the stock market, they're not doing it because they want to announce how much money they made. They're doing it because they're telling you a story, a story about their perspicacity, a story about their insight, a story about their guts, right? 
that what we are seeking to do here is work that matters for people who care. Do you know what work that matters is? Do you know who the people who care are? Because if all this is is, well, I need the listings and I need the commission, that's not work that matters. Because plenty of other people can do that. And people who care, people who want what you have that they can't get from anyone else, that's hard to find, but worth seeking out. We are seeking enrollment. Now, enrollment's an interesting phrase because when we think about public school enrollment, we mean you have to go. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the opposite of that. Actual enrollment is people who want to go where you are going. People who seek to make and live and embrace the change you seek to go on. So in the book, Purple Cow, I talk about uh, uh, a real estate broker in my town, a person I actually bought my house from. And his father started the firm. And he and his father have been inside every single house in this town of 2,200 houses. So here's what happens if you work with him to buy a house. He takes you on a tour of town. And he drives past all these houses that aren't for sale. And he tells you who lives there and who lived there before that. And he tells you about what this kid did and where they went. And he tells you about this and he tells you about that. And he gives you this half hour guided tour of what does it even mean to be a resident of this town. And if you don't get the joke, you're probably not gonna buy a house from him. But if you say, this is why I came here, the weird zoning laws, the difficulty in getting a permit, the fact that the Mother's Club is filled with members all of whom are over 75 years old. The fact that there's a committee fighting to keep a rusted water tower in a Superfund site from being taken down. That's why we're here. If you are enrolled in that journey, who else would you want to show you a home? And if he needs to sell you a house two towns away, you don't want to buy it from him because that's not who he is. This, I live right next to the Hudson River, which is a, a fjord or tidal estuary. This is a barge. And the barge is being pushed by a tugboat. So I wanted to show you this partly because it's a little bit of trivia, which is I thought tugboats tugged, but most of the time they push. And the reason they push is it gives them more control. That there isn't the slack in the line going back and forth. That management is about pushing and telling people what to do. But these, these are birds flying in formation. And as my friend Zig Ziglar taught me, what you'll notice is the front bird keeps moving around and it changes which bird's in front. But none of the birds are forced to follow the lead bird because the lead bird is leading, not managing. And the thing is, in this industry more than almost any other, there aren't very many managers. Managers, people who use power and authority to tell other people what to do, not so many room, not so much room for that. But leaders? Leaders who say, I'm going over there, do you want to come? Leaders are the opposite of clerks. Leaders aren't hustling. Leaders aren't hacks. Leaders can stand up and describe exactly why they're doing something and where they're headed. They might not always succeed, but they have a vision and a goal and they're willing to share it. Instead of running around looking for prospects, maybe what you need is students. Students who want to learn from you. Students who would voluntarily sign up for your email newsletter and read it. What permission means is if you didn't send it out next week, folks would call you up and say, where is it? I miss you. Are you okay? Is that what would happen if you didn't send out your email blast? I hate that word. Your email blast next week? Would people call up and say, where is it? I miss you. You know, my email's not that hard to find. Please don't send me junk in the mail. But I can't tell you how many real estate brokers from around the country send me junk in the mail. Guess what? You cannot spam your way to victory. No, what you can do is tell a story. Stories are the original human technology, not once upon a time or the Princess Bride or Star Wars. That's not what I'm talking about. Story is the way it smells when you walk into your mom's house on Thanksgiving. A story is that looky feeling you get when you get a bad handshake from somebody. A story is thinking right now about the best 
teacher you had in high school. These are stories that get to our core because someone showed up in a certain way. I have very few stories that I've heard from people who were clerks in the real estate business because they were doing something that was important because it needed to be done, but lots of people could do it. No, instead, we need to figure out how to go outside our comfort zone and live and tell a story, a true story, an authentic story, a story we can point to. Once people get your story, that's what they buy. They don't buy how many uh, listings you got last year, those full page ads that go on and on in New York about the number one producer. Nah, people aren't informed enough to compare your stats to somebody else's stats. If they were, you probably wouldn't win that often. No, but they know a winner when they meet one. And if that's the story they need to tell themselves, I'm a winner and my broker's a winner, that's the story. But there are countless stories available because there are countless people who are looking for a real estate book. Now, I'm gonna go sideways here for a few minutes, and I hope you're thinking of your questions because in about 15 minutes, we're gonna start taking them. Genre and generic do not mean the same thing. Generic is the real estate broker with the business card with their little picture in the corner, driving exactly the same car as every other real estate broker, answering the phone in the same way as every other, you get the idea. That's generic, it's replaceable. Genre is, what does this remind me of? Genre says, if I buy a comic book with a superhero I've never seen before, it still matches Batman, Superman, Green Lantern, because even though the story is different, it's in the same genre. And you have the opportunity to see genre and then to bend it, to do the reading and to understand how to be distinct. Not distinct because you want to stand out, but distinct because you're telling a story to someone who needs to hear one. And you need to bring good taste to the table. Good taste means you know what your people want just before they do. It's not good taste to wear a clown suit to a funeral. You don't have to experiment with that. You do have to experiment with a lot of other creative options that are available to you. Because if you're not being creative, you're not gonna stand up. And what it means to be creative, two parts. One, doing something generous to help somebody else. And two, something that might not work. If you're sure it's gonna work, it's not creative. If you're sure it's gonna work, it's in the manual. You're sure it's gonna work, someone else is doing it too. But when we start to be creative on behalf of other people, when we market with them instead of at them, we become that meaningful specific. And now for the first time at scale, what you get to do is treat different people differently. This is something that is completely missing from the real estate industry. How many questions do you need to ask somebody before you find out that they're different than the person who came before. Because they're sending you signals all the time. Is this a buyer who wants to win at all costs? Or is it a buyer who wants to tell themselves the story that they got a good deal? Because those are two totally different outcomes. And they're two totally different people. And if you've got a, I want to win at all costs buyer, you have to treat the transaction and the potential for a bidding war differently than if you have a buyer who's trying to shortcut the system. What questions are you asking so that you can treat different people differently? Because if you just go down the list and slam and bam to try to get everyone the same, to force them through your funnel, they're gonna leave. Because Zillow is smarter than you. Because they are used to searching for what they want on Google and finding it. We are used to buying so many things without an intermediary. You need a dermatologist? Well, it used to be. The only way to get a dermatologist is to ask your doctor. Now you go to ZocDoc, you compare eight dermatologists and you find the one you want based on what you want. Maybe your story is, I need a dermatologist who can see me today. And maybe your story is, I need a dermatologist who's board certified and admired by their peers. Or maybe it's, I need a dermatologist who is close to my house. Different people want different things. So we're done with everyone. Everyone doesn't make sense. Only one person buys a house. Someone is what we care about. Not everyone, someone. Which specific mindset? I don't care about demographics. I don't care about someone's race 
or sexual preference. I care about their choices, their choices about what story do they want to tell themselves? Because if we can help bring that story to life, they will say thank you. And so I managed to talk more than half an hour without saying the seven words that describe marketing through and through. So the seven words are, people like us do things like this. Who are the people like us? What kind of person buys a house on Main Street in Park City? People like us do things like this. One of the things you may notice if you go up the ski lift in Park City, mysteriously, when there's three feet of snow on the ground, you notice all these black squares. What are the black squares? The black squares are heated driveways. You go to another ski town, not one house has a heated driveway. Why do these houses have heated driveways? People like us do things like this. And that is the essence of culture. That is how we establish where people are going. And so, when we start to think about people like us do things, when we start to think about treating different people differently, these two words become essential. Status and affiliation. Status doesn't mean luxury goods. Status means compared to all the people around me, who's up and who's down. Maybe you know somebody with a grip of a handshake they're trying to move up. Maybe you know someone who's really a jerk at most closings because they are keeping score of a certain kind of behavior. Maybe somebody needs their car to be just a little bit more expensive than everybody else's. Or they're willing to live on that block, but they're not willing to live on this block. Why? Status. Often, when someone is buying a house who already has a house, and that's most of the people you sell houses to, what they are actually doing is buying a story about status. Where do I fit in the hierarchy? And other times, and this is not just in real estate, this is in everything. Other times, we're talking about affiliation. Who's to my left? Who's to my right? How do I fit in? You can't have a better heated driveway than everybody else, but if everyone has a heated driveway and you don't, you don't feel affiliated. You don't feel like you are connected at the same level. And so what we do for a living when we build these stories that cause change to happen, is we are trading in status and affiliation to make change happen. And we get to position ourselves, not because we want more than our fair share, but because we want to help people get what they want. If you walk into a Ferrari dealership and you say, I have an $8,000 budget and I need a, a beater car to drive to the station when I commute, the Ferrari dealer will not try to sell you a Ferrari. If they're any good, they will hand you the phone number of a trusted dealer of used cars a mile away. But you say, why? Don't let the lead out the door. Well, that's selfish. Because guess what? That's not a lead for you. That person's not going to buy a Ferrari. But if you can serve them, if you can offer them connection, you will earn trust. And trust Trust is far more precious than attention. And so, when the phone rings and the person who is looking for a home would be better off three towns over, you should walk them over three towns. And you should introduce them to a broker that will do a better job than you. Because it is narcissistic to believe that you will do the best job. That's inconceivable. That you are the best broker for every house and every place that one can imagine. No, you're not. But if you are specific, if you are serving, if you are teaching instead of hustling, you will eagerly send people to someone else. If you're not doing that, that's a symptom. But if you are, it will come back to you. It will come back to you many times over. I don't care about your logo, but I do care about your brand. Your brand is the promise. It's the shortcut. It's the expectation. In my head, what do I expect before you even open your mouth? So let's think about two famous brands, Nike and Hyatt. So Hyatt has a logo, you would recognize it. Hyatt doesn't have a brand. Because if Hyatt came out with a line of sneakers, and I said, everyone here, draw what Hyatt sneakers would look like, most of us couldn't do it. But Nike, Nike has a brand. Because if Nike announced they were opening a hotel, I think all of us could imagine what a Nike hotel would be like. 
So you, your brain, if you switched careers to become a psychiatrist or a pizziolo with a local pizza place, would people have an expectation as to what it would be like? Because otherwise, you're just a cog in the system, but you can stand for something and you can activate the network effect. The network effect says a fax machine doesn't work if no one else has a fax machine. Because if you try to send yourself a fax, you'll just get a busy signal that your email or your Facebook or whatever works better if your friends have it too. And so what is it about what you do that works better if I tell my friend? What is it about how you spend your time that works better if I spend my time bringing other people in? because there's no law that says you can't have a weekly cocktail party for new and old neighbors to meet each other. There's no law that says that you can't figure out other things you can add on top of the given clerk work that make being part of your circle worth it. And that is the future of this industry because community is what people are buying anyway. Community is how far is this not just from my office, but from the school, from the playground. Who are my neighbors gonna be? Am I gonna be glad I came here? What will I tell my mom? What will I tell my mother-in-law? You're in the business of giving people those stories and making those stories true. So when we think about what does it mean to do your job better than Zillow ever could, because you can bet Zillow wants your job, it means that you can be trusted. And to be trusted, flip side of being loyal, you know, the airlines like to have a loyalty program. No one's loyal to an airline. For a dollar, you would switch airlines because the airlines have worked so hard to all be the same. Now, what it means to be trusted is that when it gets hard for you, you'll do it anyway. That when it's not convenient for you, you'll do it anyway. What it means is that you have chosen to be on the hook and glad of it. And then you turn around and you keep that promise, no matter how good the excuse is. So this idea that you need to hustle for attention to stand out, you can't win that auction. You can't find enough money to do that. You can't figure out how to win when you are up against people who will hustle harder than you. No, what you've got here is the opportunity to do something bigger than that something more important than that. You've got the opportunity to matter. So when you think, how am I gonna get more attention? What sort of gimmick can I do? How can I build a bonfire? Don't burn trust to get attention. You don't need more attention. What you need are people who care about your circle, who wanna be in your circle, who benefit by sharing your ideas with other people because it helps their status and their affiliation. That is where the future lies. So I got two stories to tell you, but I'm so eager to talk uh, to Tom that uh, I'm gonna do them sort of quickly. Here's the first one. I live in, right next to Yonkers, New York, on the tidal estuary, the Hudson River. It's uh, 184 miles from Boston. How do I know? Because I used to have a tech office in Boston, Massachusetts. And once a week, I would drive there to see all my engineers. And inevitably, I would get caught in a two or three hour traffic jam and spend the whole time looking up and seeing planes mm -hmm. flying into Logan, no problem. And I would curse and say, I should have flown. And every once in a while, I would fly, but then I'd get stuck in air traffic control delays and look down and the cars were having, no, no matter what I did, I lost. What can you do? So one time, it was before 9 11, I decided to fly. And I get from the White Plains Airport to Logan Airport in 29 minutes. It was amazing. And I have a full day of meeting. Eight o'clock, I get back to Logan. I'm pretty bedraggled. And you guessed it, karma. We circled the White Plains Airport for an hour and a half until we ran out of gas and had to make an emergency landing in Albany, New York. Now, there may be some people listening to me who love Albany, New York, but that is not my experience. I was just about to say. And the pilot comes on and says, yeah, we're in Albany, and I think I can have you back to White Plains by 1 a.m. Well, this is ridiculous, because Albany 
is only an hour and 20 minutes by car from White Plains, where my car is. So I go online, and I see that Avis is still open. They got one car left. It's a four-door, and I pay for it immediately. They got five minutes before they close. I shut my laptop, I stand up on the plane, and I say to everybody, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not a psychopath, I'm wearing a tie. I just got the last car that's available. My car's in White Plains, so is yours. I got three empty seats. Who wants a free ride home? And not one person raised their hand. As far as I know, they're still in Albany. And I spent the whole ride home thinking, was it my presentation? Was it my pitch? Do I need a better deck? And then I realized what the problem was. The problem was we had been indoctrinated, you and me and everyone else, into believing that if we stay on the plane, it's United Airlines' fault. And if we get off the plane, it's our fault. And so we stay on the plane. And I'm here today to beg you to get off the plane. That the revolution is here. It is happening all around us. And hard work is not sufficient. What is sufficient is salbana, the Zulu term for I see you. Doesn't mean I see your face. It means I see your parents and your grandparents and your great grandparents before you. It means I see your fears and your hopes and your dreams. It means I'm enrolled in your journey if you're enrolled in mine. And we have a chance to do that, to find salbana. And the second story happened to me not far from Wyoming in New Mexico. I got invited to this secret conference and uh, there were playwrights and business people and authors and other fancy folks there. I had to bring my family with me. And the highlight was to hear Neil Armstrong speak. I became friends with him over the weekend. I think it was his last public appearance. And Neil was there to talk about the Apollo 11 mission that changed the world. And it's the last night, it's 42 degrees out, it's freezing and they give us blankets. We're out in the Mesa and it's cold and there's all these stars out and they build this big campfire. And standing in front of the campfire is Neil talking about the mission to the moon. And as he's talking, the biggest full moon I have ever seen rises over his shoulder. I think there was some advanced planning involved. All I know is he stopped and he turned and he says, I've been there. Here's the deal. In 1969, NASA sent people into space and brought them back safely. When the sum computing power of the entire institution was less than the device in your pocket, you have enormous benefit of the doubt and trust and privilege and technology and opportunity. And when it feels all too much, like there's just no way forward, please go outside and look up at the moon and realize there are footprints on the moon. My friend Shalene says, look, there's no question you're gonna succeed. You're here, you've already succeeded. That's not what's on offer. The question is, will you seek to matter? I hope you will. Back to you, Tom. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Seth Godin in the house. So I guess we gotta go that way. Right, exactly, exactly. Yes. Seth, how many virtual standing ovations do you get? I actually bet it's a bunch. Never before. Now. Do you all have a little more context for why I say, I don't read his daily emails, I study them. Seth, you wouldn't know this, um, but I do, because I have one in a box and I have one on the coffee table of my house. But the book that you sold that was the thousand best blogs with all the beautiful photography, I bought two of those, right? And here's my, hypo my hypothesis, one, I wanted people to come into my, my house and look at this thing and say, what is that? And watch them open it up and start to read all these insane blogs and then of course all the beautiful photography. And the second one is, I kept it completely in the box sealed and I know I'm gonna sell it on Amazon for like $100,000 in the future. I just know that. That's how much I'm obsessed with his work. What? Jason and I sat back there and we started <laughs> rattling out how many questions? Uh, like. 
half a dozen or more at least. Okay, so Seth, this is my dear friend, Jason Pantana. He leads all of our marketing workshops, all the digital workshops, and he's been helping create the revolution amongst all of our client base to do more videos, to tell more stories. So we just sort of collaborated on a bunch of questions. I'm gonna let you rip them out and yeah. then we'll just rip a little bit, but I wanna do the first one. Please. Seth, your last book is called it, The Practice. The Practice, every book you do, I say that's the best book, even though Purple Cow is still my all-time favorite. You didn't really touch on it enough. Please explain the concept of the practice and why it's so important for this group to take on the practice, please. So we're gonna set a real estate record here. I'm going to teach more people how to juggle at once than anybody has ever done in history. Now, yes. you are a high performer, and so my guess is that you're also a good person. My guess is if you see a juggler, you are rooting for them to not drop the ball. And if I said, want to learn how to juggle, you would quickly grab the three balls. You throw one, you throw two, you might catch one, you might catch two, but soon one of the balls will go out of position. And when it does, you will lunge for it because you don't drop things. But now you're all the way over here, so now the next ball is definitely going to hit the ground. Here is how you learn how to juggle. You use exactly one ball. And you throw it and you let it drop for 20 minutes. And then you use the other hand and you throw it and you let it drop for 20 minutes. And then finally, you do throw, catch, throw, catch. After an hour of this, you will be good at throwing. Because juggling is not about catching. Juggling is about throwing. And so what the practice is, is to get out of your high school mindset and stop worrying about being Mr. and Ms. Perfect, stop worrying about fitting in, and instead say, how am I going to get good at generously throwing even though I know the catches aren't going to work at first? Because once I'm good at throwing, the catching will take care of itself. Now, my friends, does that relate to making phone calls going on appointments, <laughs> shooting videos, creating content, what do you guys think? Yeah. So what did he just tell you? I, when I interviewed him on the podcast, I'm like, how do you, how do you write 9,500 daily blogs and going? He said, I write every day, all. Oh. Got it, that's the practice, yes? Jason, next question. All right, so we were talking backstage about maybe the mindset of where a lot of folks are in the room right now and they're inundated with tech, there's all these new opportunities, should I be doing this, should I be doing that? And then, and I think, you're, I, I think I know we're gonna go with this because I just watched your analogy which is brilliant about being patient, throwing the ball, not catching the ball, taking time to build the craft. But what would you say to everybody in the room who feels the pressure and the burden of, I have to do this, I have to do this, where do I start? What do you say to us? Yeah, the tech companies have made you into a pawn and a victim because they want you to be slightly insecure and to use everything. And I have spent less than five minutes on Twitter in the last 12 months. I don't use Facebook. I don't use LinkedIn. It's okay. It's fine. Being a wandering generality, as Zig would say, isn't going to get you where you want to go. There are lots and lots of people who are victims of, well, I'm pretty good at this, I'm pretty good at this, I'm pretty good at this, I'm pretty good at this. If you were the emotional and moral mayor of your town, you don't have to get elected, but if you were the mayor of your town, would you get more listings? Of course you would. What would it take to do that? Well, I would know how to do it with an email newsletter that you could build on MailChimp for $19. It's not very hard. That's not the hard part. Getting good at the latest tech isn't the goal. The goal is to be missed if you were gone. How do you become great at one thing and ignore the rest? How many of you just got that message? For all my coaching clients, how many times has your coach said, why don't we just get good at this? And then let's add another one. And let's get good at this. And then let's add another one versus let's go try and try 35 things. Next question. All right, I love it. What should agents be thinking about when it comes to Google? That's all. Okay, so let, let's talk a little bit. I mean, Google hates me and the feeling could be neutral on some days. Uh, you're not gonna win 
you're not going to win the search on Google. For five years, if you type blog into Google, I was the first match. I didn't do that on purpose. It was a wonderful benefit. But if I had been depending on that for my livelihood, I'd be bankrupt now because it just doesn't last. You will not win any specific Google search except for the Google search for your name. I promise you, if you type in Tom Ferry, you will find Tom Ferry. So the question is not how do I beat Google, it's how do I get people to type Tom Ferry in instead of typing in real nice. estate coach. Yes. yes. And so the opportunity here is to say, why on earth would someone look for me by name? What do I oh, have? Seth, Seth, hold on. That nobody did else you, can get. Did you all write down the question? Okay, what, Seth, what's the question? Why should... I don't remember. Someone Google me. <laughs> <laughs> Why should anybody remember you? Why should somebody type in your name? You I wouldn't say something. It's like you have to be remarkable. You have to be the one that they go, she was the one, he was the one. The, Seth, you just happen to have 5,000 purple cow milk cartons, right? Just sitting around and you're like, this is what I can finally use with them? So I knew that I wanted to take my own advice. And when I wrote Permission Marketing, I did that with that book. How could I use a book to create a conversation? Well, we've seen, you've heard the phrase, the tipping point. My friend Malcolm called it that for a reason. He didn't call it how to change the culture by finding blah, 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 blah. He coined a phrase. And if the only way in the world I could persuade another person that I was on the team was to use the phrase, the tipping point. And one of the best things that happened with the book is I got an email about a year into it, and a guy writes to me, he says, look, I got two bosses, it's a matrix organization, and my first boss said, we're doing a presentation next week, you gotta get up on this purple cow thing. And then a couple days later, the second boss said, we need to really get into this purple cow thing. So I get this email from the guy, he says, I thought you'd like to hear this. He said, I go to the presentation, and I give a presentation about your book, and my boss says, there's a book? That's how I knew I had accomplished something. Because Purple Cow didn't exist so I could sell books. In fact, the fewer books I sell, the better it's doing because I was just trying to start a conversation. Did you all get that? What are people saying about you? What are, the, what are people, like, so all of you have seen my friend, uh, my client Tim Smith's video, Teach Me How to Duffy. Not only did that video get uh, five million views of a real estate listing, five million views, there is a cocktail at one of our favorite restaurants in the harbor in Newport Beach named after his video that was about a listing. Turn to your buddy and say, that's a goal. That's a goal. That's a goal. And, and he didn't start it by saying, gosh, you know what I want? I want a video that's going to go viral and all these people are going to talk about it. He was like, what is the best way for me to showcase this house? And then secretly he said, and I've always wanted to rap. And of course he got to do a little rap about the house and the thing went viral on bananas. And to this day, he still gets people that go by the owners of the new house on the Harbor, usually drinking over the weekends, hitting their horn and going, teach me how to duffy, which means he's probably going to get it as a listing soon because no one wants that shit. <laughs> but that's what he's saying. So what's another question? All right. So let's go back to the juggling analogy. Let's say that you have too many balls up in the air already. What do you do? How do you back out without losing momentum that you're already generating? Um, okay, so there's a, a lot of things tied up in that question. Part of it has to do with management versus leadership. Part of it has to do with being a freelancer. I'm a freelancer. You're looking at my entire team. If you see my words, I wrote them. Versus being an entrepreneur. Meaning, there are people who, if you can identify a task, they are doing it. That one of the ways to move up as a freelancer, the only way to move up as a freelancer is to get better clients, or in the case of your industry, sell more expensive homes. But if you want to grow as an entrepreneur, you build a team. And so if you are doing any job that can be built, that can be done by someone who isn't you, it is your job to have them do that job, as opposed to hiring the most competent, cheapest, easily available person who is you. Because you have a lousy boss, and that boss keeps calling you at night in the middle of the night telling you you're not doing a good job, making you worry, threatening your livelihood, and that boss is you. You gotta get rid of that person and find a better boss.
Now, in case you all were wondering, it was written in the contract.